Nineteenth century London society was wonderfully rich and varied. Terrible poverty rubbed shoulders with great riches, and in between were the newly emerging professional and business people, tradesmen, factory and office workers, who were the mainspring of the nation's wealth. In the quiet and respectable streets of Kensington lived the Stephens family, not rich, but comfortably near the upper end of society. Virginia Stephen was born here on January 25th, 1882, and it was to be her home for the next 22 years. Her father, Leslie Stephen, he was later Sir Leslie, had been married to a daughter of the novelist William Thackeray. She died, leaving him with one child, Laura. Both his father and grandfather had been writers, and he had considerable literary skills. He edited the Cornhill magazine for a number of years and then the huge dictionary of national biography, the first of its kind, covering everyone of note in British history. Stephen's second wife was Julia Duckworth. Her husband, Herbert Duckworth, had died, leaving her with three children, George, Stella and Gerald. Julia was a first cousin of the Duchess of Bedford, and came from an artistic background. She had close family ties with the pre-Raphaelite painters Holman Hunt and Edward Byrne Jones. Her sister, Julia Margaret Cameron, who took this picture, was a famous photographer. With Leslie Stephen, she went on to have four more children. Vanessa and Toby were the first two, followed by Virginia and Adrian, so there were eight children in all, with the first four about ten years ahead of the others. They were looked after by seven women servants, quite a normal number for such a family as the Stevens at the end of the 19th century, when modern household gadgetry and social revolution had not yet had an effect on the way we live. A short walk from home were the Kensington Gardens and Hyde Park. So they had room to play and even skate in the winter on the Serpentine. Otherwise, in her childhood, she knew the calm streets of Kensington. In the next street lived the novelist Henry James, a great friend of her father's. His capacity for talk was legendary, and in his excitement his chair tipped further and further back. On one occasion, to the children's delight, he finally hit the floor from where he continued talking. The novelist George Eliot they also knew, and the poet Tennyson. Books, writing, publishing, editing, it was a rich background for a future novelist. The family had its traditions, and one of these was their annual holiday in St Ives, Cornwall. From childhood to the age of 14, Virginia spent several weeks of summer with her family, friends and relations at Talland House on a hillside overlooking Corbis Bay and the harbour. In the distance, they could see the Godrevy Lighthouse. As with all of us, the secure and happy memories of this part of her growing up were of great importance to her. She was to use it in several of her novels, Jacob's Room and The Waves, and most particularly to the lighthouse. Her sister Vanessa was to recall that in To the Lighthouse not only the setting but the characters of their parents were perfectly recalled. Their father trying to dominate but basically insecure and their mother always ready to give way to him. In the garden of Talent House they played croquet and cricket. Four-year-old Virginia is the wicketkeeper here 
and her younger brother Adrian the batsman. She developed her bowling talent until by the age of ten she was known as the demon bowler and thoroughly approved of by her elder brother Toby, who thought she was better than anyone at his prep school. Maybe visitors like Henry James and the novelist George Meredith didn't play cricket with them, but the poet Rupert Brooke certainly did. They saw little of the local people, preferring their own company, but the dramatic scenery around them made a huge impression on Virginia. Back in London, where her father added two storeys to the tall, narrow house to make room for everyone, she spent most of her time at home. The boys, Toby and Adrian, went away to school, but the girls, Vanessa and Virginia, did not. Boys went to school and university, but even in such an enlightened and thoughtful home as theirs, girls did not. They had to pick up what they could and then marry. For two very bright children, it was not a great prospect. Of course, it was always intended that they should be educated by their parents. But both parents found it hard to understand that things simple to them might not be so simple for children. They also had short tempers, so in the end the girls fell to educating themselves. In later years, the sensitive Virginia felt the lack of a formal education. But the course of reading she set herself and the extraordinary facility she soon developed with words was probably of more use to her in the course her life was to take as a writer. In temperament, Virginia was excitable even to the point of wildness. She was prone to accidents and would fall into what her family referred to as her purple rages but the two sisters early on decided that Virginia would write and Vanessa paint. Goals they both achieved. In 1891, they started writing a weekly magazine, the Hyde Park Gate News, which reported incidents in the household. Sadly, they were to have much to report. In 1895, at the age of 49, their mother, Julia, suddenly died. It was a terrible blow, but instead of trying to reassure his daughters and come to terms with his loss, their father seemed to give way completely. As a result of this, the oversensitive Virginia had a nervous breakdown, and her half-sister Stella began to run the house. Not long afterwards, Stella announced she was getting engaged. The prospects of losing her so soon after Julia's death drove the father to demand that she live with them all after her marriage. For three months, Stella was gloriously happy, and then, suddenly, she caught a fever and died. Medical care at the time was still extremely limited, even for the well-off. For Virginia, this second abrupt loss was more devastating than the first. Her happy childhood was gone. Her father, lost in self-pity, was no help to her. Her brothers were away at school, her half-brothers at work, and even Vanessa seemed to have found another life for herself outside the home. Social life was always difficult for Virginia. She could talk forever, of course, but that was not what was needed. She had no small talk. Meanwhile, at this time, according to later biographical notes, her half-brother George Duckworth's sympathetic embraces sometimes turned into direct sexual advances. With no female adult in the family to turn to, it's easy to see how this may have contributed to Virginia's sexual frigidity and mental instability in later years. Where he might have helped, her father only made things worse by making emotional demands. She still respected his intellectual worth, 
but she found herself turning to a friend of the family, Violet Dickinson, with whom she remained emotionally close for some years. In 1904, when Virginia was 22, Sir Leslie Stephen died. She was full of feelings of guilt. She hadn't loved him enough. She had forgotten his good qualities. The tensions within her rose to such a peak that it became quite clear that she was approaching madness. She claimed to hear birds singing in Greek and finally attempted suicide by jumping out of the window. It was a turning point in her life. Somehow the family got her through it, but they determined to leave their house in Hyde Park Gate, the house of all the deaths, Henry James called it. They moved to an area of leafy squares and sound 19th century houses called Bloomsbury, centred around the British Museum. Their relatives thought it was not a good enough address, but they felt that it got them away from exactly those people who had disapproved of their upbringing. Now they would be free from strict convention and class restrictions, and Virginia in particular would have a better chance to be herself. In 1899, Toby had gone up to Cambridge and become friendly with people who had formed a sort of philosophical society called the Apostles. Entry was strictly limited and only by invitation to the very bright. Members who included the novelist E. M. Forster and the philosopher Bertram Russell were members for life. They met weekly and were expected to discuss things with complete intellectual honesty. Only the very brightest undergraduates ever made it into the group. In 1902, a young man called Leonard Wolfe was invited to join, and other undergraduate members of this time were Lytton Strachey, later to become famous as a biographer, and Maynard Keynes, whose economic theories were to change the world. Toby was not invited to become an apostle, nor was his great friend Clive Bell. However, the unusual household of young people at 46 Gordon Square was just the place to meet after they all left Cambridge. On Thursday evenings, Lytton Strachey was odd to look at, but witty and cultured. Clive Bell, eventually to be something of an arbiter of English cultural taste through his books and articles, was not seen as a great intellectual, but a true amateur of art and literature, as well as having the air of a country squire. Another apostle who came was Saxon Sidney Turner. Everyone thought he was brilliant, but in the end it seems he achieved nothing at all, although you might call that an achievement in itself. The philosopher G. E. Moore was the leader of the pack. In his great work, Principia Ethica, he had laid down the tenets of rationalistic thought and action which they all struggled to meet. Virginia was an accepted part of all this, and she must have felt that at last she was beginning to have a place in the sun. Virginia and Vanessa were highly regarded for their beauty, and had most of the men who gathered at the Gordon Square house not been homosexual, their beauty might have led to other developments. It did lead to Lytton Strachey actually proposing to Virginia. She didn't immediately turn him down, but he thought better of it, and they remained friends instead. Meanwhile, her writing began to take practical form in the shape of articles and reviews published in a weekly newspaper. She began teaching literature at Morley College, an evening institute for working men and women, what we might now term adult education. Here she was with people who had to work for a living and who had had little education. It was an important three years in her life as she began to realise how intelligence and worth had little to do with social background. She came to care about her students and to understand their needs. 
In 1906, Toby died of typhoid fever caught on a holiday in Greece. Not long after this, Vanessa became engaged to Clive Bell, one of the heterosexual habitués of Gordon Square. She and Clive stayed there while Virginia and Adrian moved to a house in nearby Fitzroy Square. They were still together a great deal, of course, and about a year after the marriage, Clive and Virginia began a sort of casual flirtation, which was to last some years. She doesn't seem to have been in love with him, just lonely and jealous of her sister's happiness. Naturally, all this didn't appeal to Vanessa and relations became quite strained for a time. Virginia, in her own circles, had become a sparkling talker with an almost uncontrollable imagination. Newcomers were introduced with descriptions of their lives and characters invented on the spot. In letters and conversation, she would happily describe things rather more as she wanted them to be than they actually were. She was the centre of much fun and laughter. By 1910, the Bloomsbury group had split into two distinct parts. Vanessa and Clive were the centre of the art set, who included Roger Fry, responsible for the first post-impressionist exhibition in London. Literary Bloomsbury met in Virginia's house in Fitzroy Square and included Lytton Strachey and E.M. Forster. Virginia was already at work on her first novel. Around this time, too, occurred what was known as the Dreadnought hoax. The Navy had a new and most secret ship of this name, and somehow Adrian and a friend convinced the naval authorities that the Emperor of Abyssinia would like to visit it. With Virginia in the lead row, their successful hoax made the front pages of the national newspapers. As her first novel neared completion, her first public test, as it were, Virginia suffered a nervous breakdown. It was to be a pattern repeated in some degree with all her novels. Providentially, however, in June 1911, Leonard Wolfe, an old apostle friend of Toby's at Cambridge, suddenly returned from Ceylon, where he had worked for some years as a civil servant. Within a few months, he had proposed to Virginia and been accepted. One of nine children in a barrister's family, at Cambridge, Leonard Wolfe had impressed people with his intelligence. But although he had been a good school student, he got a poor degree at university, and in the civil service exams, he failed to shine. However, he was posted to the civil service in Ceylon, where he was unusually successful. A real sensitivity towards others was his strong point. In the hope that Virginia would marry him, he gave up his Ceylon job and proposed that he should earn his living as a writer. With nothing to start off with, he could not be considered a very safe match, but Virginia had £9,000 capital and £400 a year income. It was a lot better than the £260, which had been his civil service salary. She wrote to Violet Dickinson with her usual self-mockery that she was about to marry a penniless Jew. She never saw herself as rich, certainly, compared with her friends, but her income made their life possible. She was 30 and Leonard 31 and they married in August 1912. After their honeymoon, they went to live in rooms in Clifford's Inn. Leonard had his first novel published about his Ceylon life, and though he made no money, it was well received. Virginia worked on at The Voyage Out. As she got near the end, her health began to be affected. It was the beginning of a pattern. It's not uncommon for creative people to be nervous when their work is about to be put to the test, 
but for Virginia Woolf the experience was extreme. She couldn't eat and began to have delusions. She spent time in a nursing home, but on returning home attempted suicide. It was a huge shock for Leonard. He hadn't been sufficiently warned of the extent of Virginia's instability and depression, and the awful consequences. However, with the care and sensitivity to her that he showed throughout their life together, he worked out that if he kept her away from excitement and pressure, making sure she ate well, then she could remain balanced both mentally and physically. To this end, they moved out of central London to the calm of Richmond. They also found a refuge in the country. Virginia had already spent some time on the South Downs, near Brighton. In the village of Furl, this house still bears the name she gave it, in memory of her Cornwall days. Together, Leonard and Virginia found Asham House, which was to be her favourite home. To Asham, of course, came all their friends. Her first novel, The Voyage Out, was published in 1915, right in the middle of the war. Critics liked it, and E.M. Forster, the most successful writer in the Bloomsbury group, admired it, so she was happy. Under Leonard's eye, she was to enjoy 20 years with no major breakdowns and the steadying experience of married life and her writing. So successful was Leonard's care that many of the people she met throughout this time knew nothing of her background of mental illness. To the outside world, she always appeared lively and balanced. Her marriage to Leonard had turned out to be the key to a successful run of creativity. It's quite likely that without Leonard's insights and patience, she would not have been able to write the book she did. In 1917 they embarked on a new project. They bought a small printing press and published a book. It was hard and time-consuming work, but they made a small profit, and over the next few years the Hogarth Press expanded into a major publishing company. They were the first publishers of the poet T.S. Eliot and the writer Catherine Mansfield. She was very important to Virginia Woolf as the first other woman she knew who was utterly committed to writing. For many years, Virginia spent her afternoons setting type, sewing bindings and packaging up orders. It was salutary work for a writer. As the business prospered, the press was able to take on more staff and they did less actual printing. Sadly, they had to give up Asham House in 1919, but they bought a new home at nearby Rodmill. Monk's house was to be their country home for the rest of her life. At first there was no gas or electricity, but her increasing success meant they could afford improvements. As she became more assured in her writing, through the sheer quality of her work, and her power to innovate, she began to have an effect on the writing of her day and to give the novel new directions. With To the Lighthouse in 1926, she had a major success and from then on they were well enough off to stop worrying about money. Now they could buy a London house again. In 1923, Virginia met Vita Sackville West. Her family home was the wonderful Knoll Castle in Kent, the 16th century home of the Sackvilles. The two writers became very close and began what amounted to a love affair. Virginia wrote a rather astonishing novel, Orlando, which described Vita's life as if she aged from 16 to 60 between the years 1586 to the present. Not only that, but she started life as a boy and changed to a woman. The novel has psychological dimensions and overtones 
which was startling at the time. At a pleasant farmhouse called Charleston, not far from Rodmill, lived Vanessa and her children. Vanessa had left Quentin Bell and lived with the artist Duncan Grant, long a part of their lives. Her doctors had recommended that Virginia should not have children, so her sister's children were very important to her. They all remember how easy she was to relate to, joining in their games and readily accepting their fantasies. She had a natural affinity with children and delighted them with her company. With people who saw her as a celebrity, she could be rather terrifying, uncompromising and easily scornful of the limitations of others. Her own youthful experience had not softened her. Through her witty and polished comparison of the lot of men and women, A Room of One's Own, published in 1928, Virginia was assured of place in the forefront of the feminist movement. She became famous and lots of people wanted to know her. One such was Dame Ethel Smythe, a composer with a powerful and demanding character. She caught you like a giant crab, said Virginia. 1939 brought the start of the Second World War. In the early air raids, their house in London was bombed, so they had to live all the time at Monk's house. They were on the route for German planes flying to London, so it was not much of an escape. It seemed to the Wolfs that it was only a matter of time before Hitler came, and that could only mean death for Leonard with his Jewish background. The pressure of finishing between the acts was on her, proper food was becoming scarce, and the whole idea of war numbed and depressed her. It was all too much for her. In March 1941, while Leonard was away lecturing, she drowned herself in the nearby River Ouse. Few writers have such skill in turning a sentence and even fewer the imagination to draw us into a web of such riches. <laughs>